Live from our studios here in Accra, this is Midi News. This is live on DSTV Channel 421 and Go TV Channel 125 and around the world on myjoyonline.com. Coming up this hour, government performance tracker suffers a major setback 48 hours after its official launch with some 67 entries wrongly itemized as executed on the platform. We will go into them. Just maybe monies have been paid behind the scene for no work done. And we are incurring a lot of costs that we can feel it on the ground. Also, political marketing expert declares Vice President Baumia stands on LGBTQ contradictory and late incoming. We bring you more. And former member of parliament for Ejusu, Governor Owusu Edomi, to go independent at the Ejusu constituency. Details as he expresses concern over voter album there. Now we have business, sports, and uh, showbiz in the next 60 minutes. Please stay with us. Thank you so much for choosing us. Let's take you straight to the Ashanti region. What a former member of parliament for Ejusu constituency, Kobina Osu Eduami, says he will contest the vacant Ejusu seat as an independent candidate. The declaration comes a day ahead of the new Patriotic Party's primary to elect a candidate for the upcoming by election. A press release from the camp of the former MP ascribes the decision to sever ties with a party to what they claim to be the reluctance of the party to deal with crucial concerns with the voter album. And further points to flaws in the election process uh, for polling station executives, claiming the deceased MP, with the help of regional executives, had picked some persons for key positions. A to the former member of parliament, Nana Osebon, who spoke to my colleague, Sweetie Aboji earlier, on the decision to sever relations with the party. The polling station executive in elections uh, in a Joshua was not done in accordance with what the general practice has been. Uh, we woke up one early morning uh, to the news that people had been selected to fill uh, police station executive positions. Uh, we protested, but the party would simply not hear or give us, give us hearing. And so the matter eventually found its way to court. And as we speak, the issue is still pending. And so it is surprising that uh, uh, the party has not made any effort uh, to, for, for even, reconcil at, at even reconciling the, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, aggrieved, aggrieved members of it, but then proceeding to, to conduct primaries when they know that there are pertinent issues to be addressed. This decision is even in response to calls by constituents. If you contact, if you, if you even come here and conduct an opinion poll, we find out that almost everybody is calling for his comeback. And so it is in response, it is in response to that call. So we are, we are more than confident. We, are, we have an exuding confidence that we, 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 we win this election. So as it stands, there's no relationship at all with the New Patriotic Party? Uh, exactly, exactly. He's contesting on an independent ticket. Okay. The schedule for election has been released. Uh, now the process, the process is on, uh, still, still, still ongoing. Uh, I think forms, uh, uh, nomination forms will be filed uh, from next week. I think from 16th or so. I'm not too sure. With a, with a, but for now, uh, we, 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 we are doing the paperwork. We hit the ground running very soon. Now, a member of Parliament's Public Accounts Committee has given indication that the minority in Parliament will be requesting an independent probe into government performance tracker. The website, which is an updated version of Dr. Baumia's delivery tracker, was expected to provide factual, reliable and accurate information on the status of some 13,000 geolocated infrastructure projects being implemented by government. However, just 48 hours after the commissioning of the website, 
management of the performance tracker says its attention has been drawn to 67 entries which were wrongly included plus some other anomalies that have been addressed. Uh, social media posts from the performance tracker team uh, read and there you have it on your screen. Uh, they have been commenting on this particular issue saying they, they, they will come and see how they can address it. Uh, meanwhile, the minority in parliament is already wading into the newly launched performance tracker. Now, a member of the public account committee and member of parliament for Buem constituency, Kofi Adam, says uh, his side of the house will be demanding an independent probe into the performance tracker, which was supposed to give account on verified project. He also claims that government has paid some contractors when their own tracker reveals work is not complete. Into them, just maybe monies have been paid behind the scene for no work done. And we are incurring a lot of costs, but we can't feel it on the ground. So when you hear that our debt has risen, but we look around us and we can see the development, what may be happening is that MPP officials are paying monies to themselves for no work done. So is, is that to suggest that in Parliament you'll be asking the Speaker to probe some of these claims that government? Sure, we will be asking for a lot of things to be probed. Based on what has happened at Public Accounts Committee, where we found these heavy and huge payments for no work done, we will be asking for a lot more things to be probed, especially projects they have declared percentage completion when we know on the ground that no such thing has happened. We have to follow the so funding source and to find out how much has been paid the contractor or claimed to have been paid to the contractor. How about the claim that the platform can be updated? It's a live platform. So well, we were told that they have placed only verified projects with geolocation. So it means we have ministers who cannot be trusted. We have ministers who can lie out there. We have ministers whose words we must not take serious because that is what we were told, that verified, that the projects have been 13,000 projects verified with geolocation. So how come something verified now happens not to be what, what is it? So who did the verification? Or what is the meaning of verified project? Unless it, it, it has a different meaning for MPP people. We have to teach them a lesson this year. Then they will know that Ghanaians are no fools. And very finally, they are comparing this to the Green Book and the fact that the Green Book was filled with deception as compared to this. That Till now, they have not been able to pinpoint anything in the Green Book that is false. But we have been able to pinpoint the, the 2020 delivery tracker and now 2024 performance tracker all the deceptions in them. They should pick the Green Book is a book. We knew that what we were placing in there were genuine projects. It's not for anyone to go and say, I'll go and update the book. It is liars who do that. Or they put something and tell you that oh, I'll keep updating. Why do you think that when you go to school and you are presenting your project, they don't accept just uh, a soft copy? Because they want you to have a right to, you have to print it, publish it for them to hold it, to see a solid copy so that you cannot go around and then be changing it later. Now let's bring you that statement from the team of the performance tracker. There you have it on your screen and it reads, following the successful launch of the performance tracker, government expresses gratitude for the remarkable interest and scrutiny from citizens. This level of engagement demonstrates the public's commitment to ensuring the accuracy and integrity of the information provided. And so that is from the, the, the team there. And it goes on to say within 48 hours following the launch, our attention has been drawn to 67 entries which were erroneously included. These have uh, been corrected. Our attention has also been drawn to some 74 projects which should have been included as they had been uh, concluded by June 2023. These have also been included. And it adds that, uh, as announced at the launch, the tracker is being continuously updated to provide a live and accurate record of the performance of the government of Ghana. We thank the public for the feedback and collaboration. So that's from the team managing the tracker. And uh, we got this from the, this WhatsApp number you have on your screen and signed by the team there. But away from the story, Professor of Political Marketing, uh, Kobe Mensah, says Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia's position 
on LGBTQ rights in Ghana is contradictory to that of his boss, President Akofuado. The vice president, in an address to Muslims during the Eid celebration in Kumasi on Thursday, declared that homosexual practices will not be allowed in Ghana if he is elected as president. By reacting to the Holy Quran is replete with verses frowning on LGBTQ acts, including same-sex marriages. My faith is therefore very strictly against the practice of homosexuality. Allahu Akbar. No ifs or no shades of grey. All the major religion, religious traditions in Ghana, Christianity and Islam, are opposed to this practice. And I stand opposed to it now, and I will stand opposed to it as president, inshallah. The vice president, however, reiterated his and the government's commitment for inclusivity in diversity for the nation. For us in Ghana, our diversity is more telling in our ethnic backgrounds and religious beliefs. And we have remarkably held firmly together as one people over the years in spite of the threat and bigotry of some overzealous individuals and groups. But reacting to this comment, Professor Kobe Menson said the stance of the MPP flag bearer does not align with that of the president, although it must be emphasized that President Akufuado has not publicly expressed a view on the issue yet. Professor Mensa also argues that the declaration by the vice president is late in coming. Knew, you know, beforehand that certainly this is not something that, you know, uh, Dr. Baumia would support, LGBTQ, and so he would firmly support the bill, and that was expectation. But expectation itself would not take the issue away. They would want an explicit you know, proclamation from the vice president. But he lost the opportunity. Time is currency. And in communication, once the moment is right, that is when you have to make the statement. He lost that position. He made people create a lot of assumptions. And he complicated his issue by uh, the president coming out to say that I would not actually assent to this particular bill. Then he was in a bad state because oh. voicing it out would become contradictory to his you know, uh, government position because the president embodies the government position. The president, to a very large extent, embodies the party's position. Now your president comes and says, I would not assent to this. He hasn't said that he supports LGBTQ. He hasn't said that, you know, he actually want LGBTQ. And of course, by extension, you can say that once the uh, uh, vice president who is a Muslim is likely to abhor it, is likely to not to support the LGBT. Christians also don't support LGBTQ. But the president, having said that he will not assent to it, somehow put it in a position that perhaps he supports it. And that makes Dr. Baumier's position much more difficult. But in a sharp rebuttal, communications director for Dr. Baumia's campaign, Dennis Miracles Abuaji, described the analysis by Professor Kobe Mensa as politically tainted, insisting there was no timeline or the vice president to make his position on the matter. Who, who gave the timeline? Who said it? Who gave the timeline? Who, who set the timeline? If, if we had a timeline set from the beginning, then we can have that conversation. I mean, Professor Mensa. Anybody listening knows it's not coming from an objective perspective. But who gave the timeline? Between who, the time... The who, who is not coming from an objective zero. perspective? Professor Mensa. Why? There's no doubt about that. There's Why? No, let's not go into that, but there's no doubt about that. But no, no, but time, I, I have to be fair time, to him. No, no, I'm telling you. He's on the other end. I can't just let you say that and, and move. Why, why do you say that? No, his position, on, especially when it comes to issues of Dr. Mahmoud Bami and the MPP. It's there, public. It's there. Go to his tweet. It's public. There's no doubt about that. He himself is not denying that. So, I mean, that's a fact that it's not coming from an objective perspective when there are issues that have to do with the MPP. 
Now, presiding bishop of the Methodist Church Ghana, Most Reverend Dr. Paul Boafo, in the latest development, the clerk to parliament has responded to the presidency's letter asking him to cease and desist from any attempt to send copies of the controversial Human Sexual Rights and Family Values Bill to the president. Ghanaians are now uh, aware of what is good for us. And so, if we are talking about the values and what identifies us and what makes us unique as a people, and you want to destroy it, Ghanaians will not be happy with it. Mm. Especially Christians, we will not be happy with it because the sanctity of family is, is at stake. And we need to guard, we need to guard it. There are other factors that will also come into play. Mm. The economy, our finances, our social, and all employment, youth, right. education, health, and all that. Mm. We are not saying that it is just LGBTQ that is going to stand. There are other factors, but LGBTQ and how the party comes out very clear on it mm. will also guide in people making their choice. Now, Joy News and Second Itakradi Metropolitan Assembly Operation Clean Your Surrounding Campaign has closed down an illegal water production company at Ntankofo, a community within the Second Itakradi Metropolis, for operating under unsanitary conditions and illegally. Listen to Abdul Karim Hudu, who is the environmental officer of the Second Itakradi Municipal Assembly, cautioning the public to be careful of the water they consume. Um, we started. The operation clean your, your surroundings. We've come to a schedule submetro. Our first point of call is at a water producing center. Yes, when we came here, or as we are standing here, they don't have, there are three workers there, they don't have medical screening uh, certificates and they produce the water. They don't have food and drugs authority certificate. They don't have suitability reports from environmental. And the last one is that they don't have a refuse container to, to put their refuse inside and then uh, join the door-to-door -door services. That is why we have closed the water treatment center. So unless he comes to pay the fine before we come and close it, he will put everything in order before we can we can open it for him. So that's the reason why we we've closed it. Um, general public, we have to be cautious of people who produce water. Yes, um, even this one, when you go inside, when you buy essential water, look at the label, whether Food and Drugs Authority number is on it, because we do join uh, instruction. They have to consult us, make sure the, the medical screening is done to the office, uh, those who are producing it before they also issue their certificate. And they know, but I'm sure they are not aware of this, like they also close it down. So the public should be aware of uh, uh, the illegal operation uh, water, such a water producers. This one is illegally pro uh, producing the water. In, in the second place, BOP, I don't think they pay. They don't pay. And they are not registered with assembly. So there are nuisances or their problems are many. That's why we close it. Away from the story, Dr. Ohine Safo, a project coordinator for Greater Accra Resilient and Integrated Development Project, Garid, uh, in a meeting with the Minister of Works and Housing together with other stakeholders earlier today, announced the measure being taken to keep perennial floods in the raining season. He listed a number of contracts awarded and their various destinations. Consultants have been commissioned and undertaking various designs uh, in order that we can provide some engineering solutions to the perennial flooding that afflicts the other catchment. Um, since last year, contracts have been awarded for a number of the interventions, even as we also make progress in concluding designs on other remaining works. As um, we have awarded contracts for the dredging of the Odo, uh, 
under a new framework called the performance-based contracting approach to dredging. And the contractor is on site and carrying out um, the dredging activities. We have also awarded a contract for the repairs and widening of the broken sections of the Odo channel from the Chimoto overhead all the way to the N1 overhead. We have awarded a contract for the reconstruction of the drain from Nima Paloma on the ringway, ring road all the way to the pedestrian mall outlet or outfall in the Odo channel. We have awarded contracts for the upgrading of sections of the Alubushi community where our designs had actually identified them to continue to suffer perennial flooding in spite of the major intervention we would have undertaken. And the um, analysis showed that those communities lack basic infrastructure, drainage infrastructure in particular, plus other basic services. And so there's a contract, uh, two contracts being undertaken in Alubushi. That would improve the stormwater drain as well as the local drains, uh, pedestrian access ways, uh, vehicular access ways, extension of the water network, as well as street lighting. Similarly, we have another intervention at Akwetiman that suffers the same conditions as Alubushi. And we'll do similar interventions of stormwater improvement, local drains, uh, vehicular improvements, pedestrian access improvements, water supply. Also, the Minister for Works and Housing, Kojo Opon Kromad, admits that the projects are not going as fast as they should. However, the compensation of the project affected persons have been secured. Also, when the compensation of the project affected persons is paid, the project zones will be secured to prevent the people from returning to the site. First of all, say that uh, the project is not moving as quickly as we had all initially uh, expected right from the project design stage. And this has been due to a number of factors. Uh, some of those factors include um, the review processes and mechanisms that were put in the, uh, in, in the, in the initial framework that required about a two-step uh, review for every work before uh, it is um, executed. Uh, the fact that um, compensation even for project affected persons were not initially envisaged in the funding arrangements that were made. Um, and then some other intervening matters where part of the funding was also moved for other purposes, etc. So it's become difficult to commit to other projects, um, especially as the World Bank's persuasion is that if you don't have the funding, you can't commit. So we understand the reasons for Now, outgoing Upper West Regional Minister Dr. Hafiz bin Sali has appealed to the leadership of the various Muslim sects in the country to eschew all forms of fundamentalism and extremism in order not to allow agents of destruction to infiltrate their ranks. Rafiq Salam had the rest of the story. The setting of the crescent the on Tuesday got on end this year's fasting in the holy month of Ramadan in the country. During this period, the Muslims did not only abstain from taking food or drinking water, but also abstain from all forms of fossil vices and nefarious activities. Both the young and the old, including persons who have mobility challenges, were wheeled to the Jujuri class of schools guardians for the two rakat, open congregational prayer. Our powers regional missionary of the Ahmadiyya movement in Islam Molvi Muzaffar Chaudhry Masur Ahmed led a prayer. He followed it up with the Eid sermon where he spoke about the importance of the holy month of Ramadan. So if we are able to follow the teachings of the Holy Quran, we can see that there will be peace in the whole world. So that was the message from our worldwide Khalifa. So I emphasize on this point that if we are going to take step by step the teachings of the Holy Quran in our practical life, then we can achieve our month of Ramadan's exercise and we can really celebrate the Eid, Eid al-Fitr. Turning to electoral violence, Mulvi Muzaffar Mashur Ahmed noted that 
Islam is a peaceful religion, and so too are its followers. He is, however, deeply worried to the marrow when names of some Muslims pop up on issues in electoral violence, giving the religion a bad name. He therefore calls on Muslim youth in the country not to allow themselves to be used as tools to foment trouble during the electioneering period. We Muslims should be the peaceful Muslims to create the peace into the country. So when I hear this thing that Muslims, they are spreading the hate or the violence in the country, I'm so sorry. But if we are able to implement the teachings of the Holy Quran in our practical lives, I think that there will be peace. And our Muslim people, when they will also listen to me, I'm hopeful that they can be very peaceful and they will also guide to the people to remain peaceful for the country. Our going up our social minister, Dr. Hafiz bin Sali, was also present at the garden. His grandfather, Imam bin Sali, laid the foundation stone for the Amunde movement in the Wale enclave some 90 years ago. Now, the Central Regional Minister, Justina Marigodasan, is appealing to Muslims and youth across the country not to allow themselves to be used by politicians to foment trouble in this electioneering year. Speaking of this year's Eid celebration, the minister entreated the celebrant to unite and live in harmony with their neighbors. There's more in the following report. The Muslim faithful in Cape Coast assembled at various prayer grounds to offer prayers to Allah for guiding and protecting them throughout their 30-day prayers and fasting. Addressing the celebrant, Central Regional Minister Justine Amarigorasan called on the Muslims to help sustain the peace the country enjoys. She particularly warned the Muslim youth to guard against anything that will make them agents of violence. <laughs> As some do you are politicians want to me on politics and to obey your day, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Where there is violence, there is no development. Where violence thrives, marriage cannot even thrive. And where there is no peace, politics cannot also thrive. This is an election year. We must do everything to protect the sanctity and the peace we have in the country. We should not see each other as enemies. You should not allow any politician to use you for their selfish gains. I know the security personnel are up to the task to help in providing security. The vice president has indicated to me that it wouldn't be long he will come and engage you himself. Oh yeah, His Excellency, Alaji, Mahmoudou, Baumia. The head of the regional Zongo chiefs, Chief Mahmoud Dandi Mazawaje, called for peace in this year's election. The good old message is that we maintain peace, especially during this election year. With regard to the people of Cape Coast, of that matter, Santa region, we are known for conducting peaceful elections. And I just spoke to my people that we should maintain that prestige. We are always known for peaceful election. And in this case, even the whole Ghana, we have to make sure that we maintain peace. It's a matter of respecting each other's view. As simple as that. We respect each other. Even if I have a message for the government with regard to the economy, I think we put people in place. We give them that mandate to work it out for us in order that our economy will be good. We are, we are looking forward to them. The Muslim prayers were said and Allah's blessings and protections were sought by the celebrants. Now, former Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, Professor Francis Kadura Edubwando, has questioned the use of unparliamentary language in Ghana's parliament. According to her, the language used in parliament leaves much to be desired and something must be done to protect the sanctity of Ghana's parliament discourse or parliamentary discourse. Now, speaking at her inaugural lecture at the University of Cape Coast, 
Professor Eduardo also indicated Ghana is heading towards ethno-linguistic identity crisis. There's more in the following report. Professor Dora Francisca Edubwando's inaugural lecture first put a spotlight on parliamentary discourse. Here are the findings of her research. The findings included that the use of unparliamentary language border on impoliteness because the language used questioned the integrity and credibility of MPs affected. It imputed intellectual weakness in their person and we also found untruth, deception, and criminality in their personalities. Karl Papa, Holmes, Mara, and Schnorr say that when you behave like this, you are being impolite. Our parliamentary discourses of our times have obscenities, provocative or threatening language, personal attacks, and insults. And we can describe them as being offensive, abusive, and insulting. And sometimes it even clouds the discussion on the table, the discussion on the floor, because people get angry, they insult, and others get angry, and the issue for discussion is lost. Our parliament has become such that the unparliamentary discourse in the discourse of our times have gone so bad that the speaker himself had to use unparliamentary language to caution the use of unparliamentary discourse <laughs> by referring to the parliamentarians as if they are in uh, the market or choba. That is unparliamentary discourse in itself. But the speaker had to use unparliamentary discourse to caution unparliamentary discourse. <laughs> Proctor, if you know the norms of language use, you will not engage in discourse that will demand that you come back later to say, oh, it was just a joke. If it's a joke, we should all say that it's a joke. Or to say that, oh, I didn't mean to say that. It is just what you meant. So when somebody, next time when somebody tells you that, oh, I don't mean to insult you, that's exactly what the person wanted to do. Proctor, the norms of respect, courtesy, and others I wouldn't have time to cover in this lecture. Those are still joining us today with me, Carlos Caloni. We'll take a short break. We'll return with business. Please stay with us. Welcome to the business segment on Joy News today with me, Emma Davis. As part of measures aimed at increasing farmers' productivity and efficiency and boost the cashew trade by improving harvest and post-harvest techniques for farmers in the cashew industry, the Cultivating New Frontiers in Agriculture has implemented its five-year PRO cashew development program in the West African cashew sector. The move, according to the country representative of the program, Eric Botte, is targeted at improving the income of cashew growers in the implementing areas by providing them with alternative sources of income. Anas Sabit has more. The five-year USDA West Africa Pro Cashew Development Program was implemented by cultivating new frontiers in Africa and with the sole aim of increasing farmers' productivity and efficiency and boosting the cashew trade by improving harvest and post-harvest techniques as well as supplying chain linkages between farmers and agro-foods companies in the five intervention countries. The program, which is in its fifth and final year, is today highlighting the outcomes and impacts of the activities undertaken over the past five years. Eric Heno Botter is the Ghana country representative of the USDA West Africa Pro Cashew Project. Uh, the West African Pro Cashew Project is working in five countries. That's Ghana, Benin, Burkina, Cote d'Ivoire, and Nigeria. And for we those in Ghana, the mandate is to support, to increase cashew production, and then improve quality. And we work through the Department of Agriculture with the support of Ministry of Agri and other collaborating partners like 3CDA, 3, 3 and then the Cocoa Research Institute of Ghana. The project also seeks to support these cashew farmers through renovation and rehabilitation of, of their farms to boost quality and productivity. Purpose is to make sure that cashew product, uh, farmers are able to get more yield and then also get more quality and also more money. 
All is to alleviate poverty and also make sure farmers have a good life and well-being for they themselves and their family. Eric also noted that these beneficiary farmers were also taken through other alternative farming methods which includes intercropping and beekeeping. This, he said, was to help provide them with other sorts of funds to complement seasons where they fail to have good cashew harvests. We are also coming to supplement and complement what the government of Ghana is doing. That's what Pro Cashew is here to support. And so we take farmers through renovation and rehabilitation. When we say renovation and rehabilitation, we mean that there are old cashew farms and which are no more fruiting. And so we have to bring new techniques of how to prune and give better qualities to these trees to start uh, fruiting again. So these are some of the trainings we give. Kipo Mimuna works with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture in the Solar Tuna Kalba district. She has been working with the Pro Cashew project since its implementation five years ago. Mimona tells me the project has been beneficial to farmers within her district, adding that she has equally benefited from the various trainings implemented by Pro Cashew. This project has been beneficial to me especially because I've learned a lot on cashew production from Pro Cashew, from new establishment, how to land preparation to post-harvest and uh, marketing. I've learned a lot and I think the farmers are also benefiting from, from it. Another beneficiary of the project, a farmer in the Bole Bamboy district narrates how the new project helped in the prevention of bushfires in the area. I'm very thankful to Prokashu because they have already bring a lot of impact to my life and to other farmers within that area. Because Prokashu has helped our farms this year to have low a fire burn outage. I can say that most of our farms couldn't burn this year because of the training they have given to us. Municipal Director of Agriculture for Tanon North, Gofred Ezena, on his part, lauded the project which he says helped in the growth of cashew in the district, but was quick to appeal for its continuity to enable more farmers benefit from the project. I think once pro cashew is in, it has really helped most of um, all, most of my families, and I, I, would, I, would, I would like it to continue, which is going to help my farmers in the district. Also present at the event are key stakeholders in the cashew value chain, including representatives from the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Anna Sabit, Joy News, Sunyane. Chief Executive of the Ghana Enterprises Agency, Kosi Yanki Aya, believes its partnership with Ghana Post will help enhance the competitiveness of Ghanaian businesses. The Ghana Enterprises Agency and Ghana Post have entered into a mutual agreement to support micro, small and medium enterprises with market access for their goods and services. The collaboration forms part of the Ghana Enterprises Agency's initiative to support the small businesses to enter major markets globally. These are through the strategic partnership. We can harness our synergies um, to create new opportunities to expand access to markets and enhance the competitiveness of Ghanaian businesses. And why is access to markets very important for us in this new project? It's really so important because we realize that over the years, people produce things and really finding markets is quite difficult. We've also realized the importance of the e-commerce platform and tools. So you have people who are on various e-commerce portals and how to get their products from one point to another is really a question that is coming up. And we believe that once we build the strong partnership together, we can work on both fronts in with the new things, which is e-commerce delivery service. And the second is also really looking at utilizing your facilities to create the access to market for the beneficiaries of our program. So thank you very much for coming. online does come. I am Emma Davis. GN Today continues. Please stay. Let's bring you sports here on the journey. You stay with me, Muftao Nabila Abdullah. The Minister of Youth and Sports, Mustafa Yusuf, has called on communities that will be participating in this year's Ramadan Cup to present players who will be given opportunity of uh, having a career in football. According to him, there will be scouts available during this year's Ramadan Cup 
to unearth talents and give them opportunities to apply their trade to the highest level. Though the competition is meant to uh, build uh, unity among communities, it also serves as a platform for uh, young talents to be identified. Uh, everyone is trying to qualify for the Olympics and having achieved this height, like a new PR, it's like I'm starting from here, then next week I go here. So it's like we're going back to the drawing board. But for the Ramadan Cup, I could not have imagined seeing the national chief imam kick a football or at a stadium. And the Ramadan Cup managed to pull all the legendary Abedi Pele, who is really seen at matches to the competition. It was a pleasure sitting side by side with the great Abedi Pele, the national chief imam, together with communities, community members for the Ramadan Cup. Community football is a powerful tool for social cohesion at the local level. And this is what the Ramadan Cup have achieved through the vision and its objectives. Those, these values are shared by the Ministry of Youth and Sports as promoting community sports is at the heart of our core objective. Sports promotion and, sp and for that matter, sports development start at the community level. And encouraging participating in community sports is to encourage the development of our games right at the grassroots. It is in the pursuit of this that our government has invested massively in the development of community facilities throughout the country. And as we speak, that we have over 150 astroturf in our various communities across the country. Indeed, the Sheikh Sharutu complex at the Fadama, where the tournament is being hosted, is one of such facilities built by our government. We will continue to promote community sports by investing in sports, more sports infrastructure for both sports and recreational purposes. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, one interesting aspect of the Ramadan Cup is the area of young talent and the, and the display. However, as I said last year, I also see players who should probably have been given opportunities to more young people to showcase their talent. And to the African Games 2023, where Cardman Evans Yamua did a jump of 2.23 meters to win a gold medal in the competition. Currently, he's African champion, but yes, to secure qualification to Olympic Games that will be happening in Paris later this year. He says his target is to secure qualification to the competition. Resetting our mind, we channel our focus. Those are 215 bars, 216 bars, we are not focusing on that again. We are going to start practicing with the 225s, 235. So if I hadn't have achieved the 223, probably 221 would have been my, my mark. That's where my, I'll, be, I'll start my jumps from. So 223 is like uh, an opening height for me now. It's, a, it's another achievement. So I need to build on. I don't have to be like reluctant and stay at 223. Then uh, we are in outdoor season, if you've noticed. So 223 should be, uh, as I said, like a stepping stone. So more to come, more to come. That's your sports for now. We do have more sports stories on myjoyonline.com. We appreciate your time. And that's all we have in this hour. You can log on to myjoyonline.com for more stories. My name is Carlos Caloni. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great afternoon.